here, we're on day two, um, which is that, you know, because of these special properties, there are special applications in a variety of areas. And today, obviously, we're going to figure out how to make some of the things or try to model and mimic the things that we're trying to do today. Um, and again, you know, going back here, the big idea is that we are um, emphasizing nanoscience is an important field that impacts advancements in modern technology. All right. Um, okay. So, okay. So the making nano, I, we already went over this, so I won't dwell too much, but you know, it's kind of like a craft project. We have all these different sets of tools that are really focused on investigate whether or not the materials that we want are, um, are what we're looking for. So, um, and Cody sort of mentioned that too. I really like his holistic way of presenting where he kind of told you a story about him and then the actual research and how it's sort of um, uh, a holy grail uh, project. Um, anyway, so again, we have all these different applications and tools. So we're kind of focused more on the fabrication side of things. And then tomorrow we'll focus more on some of the characterization that um, Cody also sort of alluded to as well. So again, top down, we already talked about this, right? Bigger thing to a smaller object. Um, whereas what we talked about today with Cody's presentation, it was bottom up. One thing I want to point out was we um, have this thing called photolithography. So photolithography is a top down method that you use to create silicon wafers that go inside of your phones, like your microchips, your memory devices, all the sort of little inner workings um, as part of your motherboard are actually built through this process. Okay, and this process, um, you are using a substrate. Typically it is silicon. So it's a round shiny circle. I'll show you guys after the break today, um, but you take it and you shine UV light through it and then you shine it through a mask. That's what it's called. It's almost like film photography actually, um, where you have a negative and you shine light through and then it um, enlarges a large a, a photo, right? Um, but in this case, we're actually shrinking it down or we're doing a one-to-one -one patterning. And then depending on the type of material you're using, it will um, cross-link and stay onto the surface of the wafer or it will go away um, and it will uh, be washed away. And then you could cut into the surface of the material and then pattern it that way. Um, and so, it's really cool um, how it's being made, all these microchips. Uh, for the sake of time, I don't know if I'll show you a video, but you do have a homework video later today, um, or later tonight, I guess, and um, they'll go over some of the ins and outs of how, how this, these microchips are being made. Um, all right, and so because of these microchips, you have to be really careful, right? Um, there's like a joke, I think, in Parks and Rec where Rob Lowe gets sick. I don't know if anyone watches Parks and Rec, but he's like, I'm a finely tuned microchip, right? A grain of sand could destroy like this whole ecosystem or whatever, right? And it's true. So um, if you have your hair is about 60 to 100 microns wide, you have little particles, you know, as you're talking, you're spitting, frankly, and little pieces of dust or who knows what is coming out of your mouth or like, you know, your clothes. They're, they're full of fabric and um, little pieces of um, fur or what hair can come out of that as well. Um, and so you have to, you know, prevent that, right? And so this is an example of like how big of an impact a particle could, um, you know, ruin your transistor or ruin something that goes inside of your cell phone, right? So um, that's why we have something called a clean room, which is down here. Sorry, you can't really see it. But um, later this afternoon, we're actually gonna go into a clean room today with some of our um, coworkers that we've got um, on campus, because our labs are open. So what a clean room does, and you'll see they're wearing what's called a bunny suit um, and patterning a wafer. And they have all these special types of engineering controls that are used. It's kind of where you have completely filtered air that um, comes down in a laminar flow. This is a laminar flow where it's coming down from top to bottom and then pushing away the particles and then filtering them again. You obviously have to wear yeah, special equipment and their uh, special clothes and then uh, use special equipment to do that. 
Um, and then this is again, is just a quick little glance at what it looks like to work inside of a clean room. Um, and we'll get to it a little bit more. And um, you'll maybe, uh, one question for you is to actually think about why some parts of the clean room is yellow. I'm not gonna tell you yet. This will build the suspense, the nerdy suspense. Um, but yeah, and we'll answer that uh, after lunch, okay? Um, all right, so now we're gonna transition over. I just wanna make it clear the clean room is really important and actually has a lot to do with some of the activities that we're doing today. So um, thin films, you're gonna take your black construction paper and you're gonna need water again and a paper towel. I don't have a paper towel, but I use the, the rectangular one. Um, and then I'm gonna pour some water into it and you're gonna need the nail polish and your metallic marker, which I really love. Uh, and what you'll do, um, and Karithika and Jenny, feel free to chime in if there's anything you wanna to add to this one. Karithika is a thin film activity pro, I would say. Um, but yeah, you'll take some water and then you'll take your marker and a piece of paper. Um, and then I will, I will stop sharing my screen so you can see it a little bit easier. But here are the instructions really quick. So you're gonna write your name or you can write a design on the top of this. You're gonna put water in the container and then you're gonna take your nail polish. So you can do a variety of ways. Oh, I don't have my nail polish. I gotta go around and grab my nail polish. Give me one second. Does the color of the Sharpie matter? No, it doesn't. I just picked metallic so you could see it a little bit more easily. Um, but okay, I'm gonna do this right now really quickly. You guys can take your time if you want. Oh, thank you for Karithika for copying that instructions over. Okay, you can do it one of two ways. I like doing it a particular way, but um, here we go. So I have my um, container of water and I have my name tag right, right here. Can you see it? All right, so then you can either put the paper in first, but I find that it gets really soggy really quickly. So I don't do that. So, um, but you know, depending on the kid or depending on your paper or material, it, it could withstand the, the water. So then you take a drop of the um, nail polish like this. Okay, and then I don't know if you can pick it up with the camera on the, the screen here. Let me get closer. Can you see? Can you see there's like a weird little iridescent color? Maybe, maybe not. But then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the paper. I'm gonna, let me zoom out a little. Okay, you're gonna take the paper and you're gonna dip it into the water like this. I kind of hold it firmly and then kind of do a scooping action and then lift it up. Okay, this was not my best work. It's okay. But then you'll see here, it has this sort of iridescent color, right? Is anyone able to do this? I know it's a little, it's a little advanced. Um, could you repeat it really quick? So we sure, put a I'm drop. happy to do that. Yeah. Okay, so you just take a drop, like you take the nail polish and you kind of like get a nice um, droplet going and then literally just drop it in and then you'll watch the droplet kind of slowly expand out and then take the piece of paper and then just basically, I just kind of shove it into one corner and then scoop it up like this and then do a quick lift off. And you'll see the nail polish kind of like stick to the surface. This one, I didn't write my name on it, but um, you can kind of see the iridescent color. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we have the forceps for a reason? Can we use that? Yeah, you can use that if you want. That's actually cool. If you do use the forceps though, sometimes the nail polish sticks to it. So you want to clean it immediately or... Is there a way to get rid of the bubbles? Um, not really. <laughs> I think that just has to work on your technique. Yeah. Can you see? I think it's better if you see it in person. It's really hard to sort of show you on camera, I think. Maybe I, I'll take a picture and I'll send it to everybody. Yeah. And Angela, I did cover the entire film. It just covered a part. Is that okay? Is it just yeah, 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 yeah. Imagine kids doing it, you know? You're going to have all different sorts of Okay. Abilities. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, but I really love this activity, right? Because, you know, you can pose the question, is this nail polish clear? Mm -hmm. And you're saying, yes, of course. Well, what if I told you it wasn't clear or I, we can make it not show up as clear, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where this rainbow effect comes in. I bet the people who are outside have a sort of maybe some better advantage because the sunlight, I think, makes it really pop. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, like you'll see, and it's, oh, okay. I kind of, you can kind of see it here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, this is actually a pretty good angle. Um, but yeah, you'll see this rainbow color and keep trying it. Honestly, if, if you're not getting it to work, keep trying. Um, or honestly, you can try to do the easier way, which is just putting the paper in first and then putting the nail polish up and then lifting up. That's another option. You yeah. can also, um, if you put it flat on the surface, you can either use your fingers or your forceps um, and actually uh, push down one side and then kind of flip the paper and lift it up. And sometimes that helps. I'm trying the other way. I don't really love this way because I think it gets really messy or more wet. Oh, but actually, you know what? Um, Leo, it did come up with less bubbles if you put the water in first and wet the paper, basically. See how it's really slick? You mean dip the whole sheet in the water before yeah, I put, put the water, polish? Or, sorry, put the sheet in the water first and then put the nail polish on top. That's when you get like less bubbles, basically. Fantastic. Yeah. But um, does this remind you of something? Have you seen this before anywhere else? Thin films? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Thin films. But even on the street, maybe? Oil. Yeah, very good on an oil slick. So do you guys have an, any idea what's happening here? Any guesses? I don't really know. <laughs> I'll say something. Um, I think that putting the nail polish in causes maybe some sort of, I don't know about a chemical reaction, maybe a physical reaction or something, and it just kind of becomes all sticky and sticks to it, and then you see all these colors those are my more observations than guess of what's going on. Maybe a, a, a physical or chemical reaction of some kind and then it changes its properties, becomes sticky. That's what I'll say. Okay, no, I like, I like all the theories. Yeah, Kritika, do you have something to add? Um, yeah, I'm just reading through the chat. So Usha said paper is attracting the molecules in the nail polish. Okay. Um, Samantha's that. kids have taken over the project. That's great. No, I say <laughs> if you have kids, this is honestly a super fun way mm -hmm. to play around with stuff. Obviously, nail polish is okay in, you know, small amounts, but yeah. Okay, I'm at really good visible light um, wavelengths. Okay, very good. So that is actually quite correct. Um, so um, what one thing I think the, the nail polish doesn't react with water. So yeah. they're not reacting at all and it's floating. And as soon as we put the paper, because of the cellulose, I guess those nail polish attached to those molecules. Yeah, that's very good. Yes, all of these things. Yeah, awesome. My second awesome. question, is that a real nail polish? Yeah, this is a real nail polish. I, I Best of Sally Hansen. I can give it to my wife after the experiment. Yeah, if you want. <laughs> so yeah, this is really great. Um, so basically what's happening is, um, so these are thin films. I think um, we already sort of mentioned it, but um, you know, they're seen in coatings, oil slicks, even you know, bubbles. Um, but basically what's happening is um, the nail polish is creating really thin film on the surface of the water because it's hydrophobic. It's kind of like, you know, if you pour a thin sheet of oil, it will spread out. It will kind of like try to kind of run away from the water almost. Um, so it'll spread into a thin film and then you're picking it up with the paper and the paper is more um, sort of sticky or the, the nail polish wants to stick to the paper more. So the paper is attracting the molecules of the nail polish. Um, and then you're picking it up and because there's sort of variations in the film itself, you'll see these rainbow effects because that's actually the different thicknesses. And then remember with um, visible light, right? It's 400 to 800 nanometers. It's a whole set of rainbow colors. And so there's just different levels of thicknesses, which then show off basically um, the different types of reflectance and absorbance of the different thicknesses of the, the nail polish. Um, so said in a different way, maybe more clearly, 
is that as the visible light is coming in, there's all this stuff that's happening with the wavelengths where there's this destructive way where they're kind of canceling each other out and making a new sort of color coming out or they're constructive where the two new wavelengths are combining. And because there's a very slight thickness, they're sort of being offset and combining. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Um, Karitha actually taught, Karithika actually taught this whole section on, um, on light and sort of the electromagnetic spectrum um, using this activity. So, and she'll talk about it a little bit more um, tomorrow, but Karithika, I don't know if you wanna give like a quick preview or anything. I really focused on waves and their properties and behaviors of light um, for this particular like mini unit. Um, and I really focused it on making sense of what was going on with the thin films um, activity with this particular activity. And the kids were really engaged in it. Um, it helped probably that it was super colorful um, and that it was so hands-on. But yeah, I'll talk more about it tomorrow. Um, I just had a question. Uh, I've been reading up on this uh, for quite some time. Um, have either of you done it where you count the rings and look at the diameter to calculate the colors of those things? Wow. Um, no, we have not. <laughs> okay. I think that would be quite hard, but I bet it's theoretically possible. Yes. I was given the, the prompt by somebody from um, a science fair once and so mm -hmm. i've never been able to do it myself and so i was wondering if you guys had knowledge of that okay there are so there is actual depending on the material you have there's kind of it's like a it's like a lot of characterization but it is sort of it can be an identifier so for example when people put thin oxide layers on silicon wafers you can kind of gauge the general thickness of the film by what color it looks like um, so that's a very real thing. The only thing is, I don't know if you could figure it out with the nail polish and the construction paper, because there's quite a bit of error there. Yeah, I was thinking there's lots of variance. Yeah, yeah. But it's, theoretically, it is possible. Um, okay, but um, I'm going to skip over this video. You guys can watch it over lunch just for the sake of time, but it sort of talks about um, sort of what Leo was kind of alluding to on measuring thicknesses of films. Um, you use light to basically probe and kind of understand the thickness, but I'm going to sort of skip over it because I wanted to talk about other stuff that's kind of um, more exciting. So with thin films, one big thing is obviously making thin films for wafers um, to be used to create devices. But another really cool part of um, this whole aspect is um, this thing where um, because of the variances of the, the film, you're actually what's called structural coloration, okay? And so this is where, although the nail polish was clear, because of the variance in thicknesses, you're showing color, right? And that's actually similar to a lot of these materials here. Um, so there's this really cool thing called the marble berry. It's this berry that exists in the wild. Um, this is its true color. I mean, it looks like a shiny little pearl, right? A blue pearl. Um, but it's because it has this nanostructured coating or, you know, thin film onto the, on the surface of its, its berry shape. Um, and so, uh, and you can click, there's a really cool article that's linked on it. If you, um, uh, you should have access to the slides, but, um, if you want to read more about it and, you know, people are really trying to mimic this, right? There are all these like beautiful green and blue scarab beetles um, that people are trying to mimic using, you know, on a car. Like I would really love a beautiful blue beetle car in a Lexus, I guess. But yeah, so something like that. Um, and then actually something that I really wanted to highlight, um, which is a really awesome example is this butterfly. Um, I think it's from Peru. It's called the blue morpho butterfly and you can actually buy their wings uh, they're really they're quite expensive you want to buy a whole thing but i actually bought some wings off of etsy <laughs> and we're actually going to look at some um tomorrow um with one of our colleagues or one of my colleagues marcin and so the blue morpho butterfly um, if you zoom in, you know, it has these little like platelets as part of its wing, but then if you zoom in more, and this is actually what we're kind of going to be able to see tomorrow, you zoom in more, they have these sort of ridges, they're called lamella. Um, and then if you did a cross section of this, if you kind of cut it this way, 
you can see these like really rigid structures and actually um, for your homework, there's a video that talks a lot about this butterfly. In it. Um, and then this is a sort of more, I think, in-depth structure and, and at a different angle of this, uh, what's called lamella. But because of this structure, because of this nanostructure, it's the reason why um, the, this blue morpho butterfly is so blue. Um, and I think it's such a cool example in nature um, when it comes to uh, nanomaterials that we're trying to mimic or try to um, hopefully mimic, but yeah. All right, any questions, any comments on this? Do you think this is a fun activity? I really, this is like one of my favorite ones personally, but yeah. would this be something that your kids might wanna do? Or I think this would be a nice one, um, you know, where it's kind of like an app reasonably accessible that you could ask the kids to do at home, yeah. Feel free to chime in, Jenny and Karithka or anyone. I think this is really neat way to interact uh, with, or just kind of introduce what light is, especially for my astronomy uh, elective yeah. I'll be next year. I think it'll be a fun way for students to start asking questions about what light is and how it reacts with materials. And mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and then with uh, physical science and chemistry as well. So there's, I, I can see applications with this. Great. Thank you, Dustin. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I just like it because it's just some, I just love the fact that it's a, such a phenomenon. Yes, it does smell. That is the big problem. I hope you, everyone is in sort of a ventilated area, but we're done with the nail polish. We can stop. Unless you want to keep playing, then go for it. Um, okay. So I'm going to keep moving along. Um, again, with the thin films, I just want to show a few examples of those thin films, you know, to make it a little less abstract. Obviously, we did the one with the nail polish, but they're just, they're everywhere. You know, they're in your kitchens for your Teflon coatings. They're in your artwork with gold, gold leaf. Thank you to myself. Okay. And then also like glasses, right, where you have your anti-reflective coating, you have your UV coating, things like that. And then even, you know, for playing, right, you have your little like silver conductive pen where you can even just draw um, a line and kind of make basically an electrical wire. Um, and even um, another thing is, you know, phones are becoming bendable. Part of the reason why is because again, shrinking of nanotechnology and then also embedding them into like thinner, smaller pieces. So then you can have like, uh, for example, here, this is a flexible solar cell. Um, so you could wrap it, you know, in a house or something or wrap it around a pole and make it make it possible. And then um, again, a few more things with glasses, coatings, the rain -X thing, oh, even sensors. Some people are trying to make really thin films that can kind of just stick to your body and sort of mimic skin. Um, and then again, some more flexible electronics like batteries and solar cells. Can I ask a quick question on this? Yes, thing? of course. Um, there's all this like new... Um literature on blue light do you know if that's true if, if it's scientifically founded like there's this new coating on lenses especially yeah like the blue glasses glasses thing i mean counter the blue light from led is that true i mean or are they just selling that i don't know that's the thing i don't actually know and i don't know if you know technology has been around that long enough or these blue glasses have been long enough that it is actually um, something that is a trend because I think it would take a lot of data to really make conclusive opinions. That said, I think right now, especially in quarantine, I'm spending so much more time on a screen and I definitely, my eyes are not happy when you know I've spent six or seven hours online, right? So I don't know. I can't definitively say yes or no, I guess. Because I have it on my glasses, but I don't know what they do. And it's been it's been selling left and right. Like every yeah, yeah. glass brand is pushing it. Yeah, yeah. But um, I guess, you know, an additional coating can't really hurt. You know, you already have glasses to probably that have a UV coating. So I would assume that um, it can't be too terrible to add it, I guess, as compared to not having it. Thank you, just curious. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you, sorry. I can try to look into it a little more, um, but I, I haven't really done too much investigating on that. Um, oh, and then one thing is Jenny, um, actually one thing is we are transitioning over to the another um, 
activity as I'm talking, but uh, Jenny, I wanted to mention a uh, highlight in the chat. She talked about um, how you can discuss the thickness of thin films and observing with bubbles. The color um, doesn't does also correlate with the thickness with the bubble film. So that's another way to do it. If you don't want to do nail polish, right? You can play with bubbles instead. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna switch over to the sun print lithography. You may have to get up and move around. So this is where we're gonna take your transparencies, right, that I cut them up for you. So you can draw like a smiley face or something, but you have to make sure you use a black Sharpie. The black Sharpie is probably the best way to do it. Okay, and I wanna make it clear. So um, in the activity notes, which you might've looked at already, you have the option, you can either use the sun, the outside sun, or you can get one of these things. It's called the UV nail lamp. I bought a few because I run a few. I do this activity quite a lot. Um, and sometimes they're indoors or at night. So I use the UV lamp. It's actually just a UV nail lamp to like cure your fingernails. You use gel nail polish, but obviously you don't have to do that. You can just send your kids outside. Um, and so what you'll do is you'll take your transparency. This is the transparency I made, right? And then what you're gonna do is take your sun print paper. Um, you're gonna take your sun print paper. Oh, okay. So you're gonna take your sun print paper, open it up. I would just actually take like a quarter piece. This is a lot of paper. So you can get a lot of mileage out of this if you, you know, cut it into pieces. So what I'm gonna do is actually just take one piece of paper and just cut a section off really quickly. And, and uh, the sun from paper, I don't know if you're familiar with the paper, but it's quite light sensitive. So you wanna kind of, I keep it um, on uh, the, the blue side down so it doesn't get exposed too quickly. And then I'm gonna just take my scissors. You can also rip it, it's, it's whatever. Um, and then just cut a piece off like that. Um, and then keep it closed, make sure it's... Angela, could you make your screen bigger so we can see everything? Oh yeah, let me, let me stop sharing, I'm sorry. So I took the piece of paper and I cut a piece off but I'm putting everything back and I'm keeping it covered, okay? So I'm not letting light come in. I just, I have indoor light over here. Um, and then another thing, this is your acrylic plate. You don't always have to do it. It's kind of better if you um, use it though. And what I do is actually, I score the top and break it up into quarters, but I'm not gonna do that. Oh, and another thing is you have to peel off the blue um, stuff which is so satisfying in my opinion. <laughs> this, so it's clear. Wow, you can see the reflection, that's crazy. Okay, so you can do that. What you can also do, um, I can actually try to do it right now in front of your very eyes, is um, score it. So what I do is I take this, you don't have to do this now, but I just wanna show you that you can do this if you want. But you can score it like this, and then eventually it will snap. You just might have to put some energy into it. But you score it. and did you hear that? So it broke. <laughs> Magic, okay. And then here I will score it again. Like that. And then you just kind of press it uh, with the score side down down the um, uh, edge of the table and then just push on it and it should snap again. Okay? You don't have to do that if you, if you don't want to. Um, but when you're ready, what we'll do is we'll make kind of a sandwich where we take the paper that's color, uh, that is light sensitive, it will be blue side up and then we'll put the transparency on top and then put the clear side, uh, the clear piece of um, plastic on top and then we'll, we'll have it sit outside for like a minute or two and then use the water to wash it off. All right, how's everyone doing? Okay, perfect. Yannette, I would maybe cut the piece of paper smaller or rip it a section off. Could Joanne, you go, go ahead. 
steps one more time. Sure. Oh, of course. Sorry. I go very quickly. Okay. So you take the transparency, right? And then you draw a design. Like I just wrote words because I'm not feeling very creative right now, but you can make something more fun. Um, oh, Karithika is putting the, um, the directions in the chat as well. So draw something on your transparency. Take the piece. Um, actually, I will reverse some of the instructions. Take your acrylic sheet, remove the blue thing from both sides. If you can cut it down, I would cut it down, but you don't have to. You can just leave it as a big chunk, totally fine. Um, and then when you're finally ready to expose it to light, I would take the piece of paper out, maybe cut a piece off of the larger piece of paper and then put it underneath like this. So you'll, and you'll have a stack where it's the paper on the bottom, then the, um, the, the transparency and then the uh, plastic sheet. So it's gonna look like this. Um, why do you recommend cutting the plastic? Just because it's so it's smaller, it'll fit the piece of paper, but you don't have to do that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me show you. Um, I do actually have uh, instructions. Oopsies. Okay. Once we're ready, should we go outside? Yeah, yeah. Once you're ready, feel free to throw your little um, thing outside. Um, and it only will take like a minute or two to get exposed if it's a sunny area. Or you can you don't ever have to leave your house if you don't want to. You can um, you can just put it in a sunny window. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put mine out somewhere. I'll be right back. Okay. Were people able to, to get it done? Anybody need help? So we'll give that like a minute or two um, just to make sure it's like fully exposed. But um, I do want to make it clear. I think this is a really cool activity because it models off of um, what people do inside of the labs. It's sort of a, a method um, to sort of make it um, be like fake lithography. And there's actually another way to do this um, with not this uh, particular sun print paper stuff where I've done it with cookies um, and frosting and sprinkles, like make an edible wafer. So you kind of make a similar um, like mask, but with like a, uh, with parchment paper and then ask the kids to you know, make a cookie and then put frosting down and then put sprinkles down um, to sort of show how you're transferring a pattern onto another um, piece of paper or another cookie or substrate. So I think it's a really interesting activity. All right, so I would give it a few minutes and then what you'll do after, when you think it's ready, um, I think, what did the direction say? I don't, I don't read the directions, but um, okay. They say one to five minutes. So we can give it like five minutes total. So while we're waiting, I will talk more <laughs> because we're trying to be as efficient as possible. Okay. So um, after what you're, what you're doing here, it's really to connect between what we do in the clean room to what you can do in the classroom, right? So we're constructing this model where um, we have this activity where we are sort of pretending to be these semiconductor engineers um, or photolithography engineers that they need to consider a lot of designs and steps. This is sort of uh, obviously a limited model, but I think it's a really good way to sort of showcase what happens in the lab. Like, you know, you wanna make sure the, the paper is covered only until it's ready to be exposed and things like that. Um, and this um, is what I wanted to go over as quick as we can, um, but is, is modeling. And these are actually slides that Jenny came up with. I want to give credit to her. I think she had to run out to take care of an errand, but um, these are her slides. I cannot take credit. So, but a model, right? Um, it's a set of ideas that are based on evidence that explain a phenomenon or phenomena, right? Um, so this particular phenomena um, is really um, based on these observable events that occur in the universe that we can use our science knowledge to explain or predict. 
Um, and the goal of building that knowledge in science is to develop general ideas based on evidence that can uh, explain and predict phenomena, right? So one example of that is how are we creating all of these devices that are so small using this process that we've heard about called photolithography, but we don't actually know how to experience that, right? And so this is a really nice way to sort of package that information out. So, um, you know, I grew up doing this as a kid, the, the sun print paper, but I just love this activity because, you know, you can make it really complicated. You can ask the kids to um, make multiple transparencies, you know, to stack multiple transparencies on top of one another. So you can think about how some scientists, they have to actually align all the different patterns together because um, that's actually how we build a circuit is layers upon layers of this basic method um, to do, to create a device. All right. Um, and even nanoscience itself, you know, there are all, it's also this conceptual model where, you know, we have all these concepts that are strung together by nanoscience. And you are even, you know, modeling a student during this PD. So it's all very meta with this, this whole model system, but right, you're acting as a student right now, but then later in the afternoon, we'll probably transition more to, you know, what it's like to being a teacher, but it's all these ideas um, that we're basing on evidence and we're sort of using models and these activities, um, sorry, these activities to be used as models um, to sort of showcase all the cool and interesting things about nanoscience, okay? All right. So, and it's been about five minutes if anyone wants to come or go and grab their, um, their paper. And then you can, you can actually just dunk it in the water that we, we use for the thin films. Okay. What does the water do to The water is gonna wash away. So it's actually gonna sort of develop your, your piece of paper. So I'll show you in one second. Did it work? Did people's work? Mine, I'm a little concerned because it didn't look, my window was not as sunny as I had hoped. But what you do is, all right. Okay, let me, sorry. So Angela, um, was anybody else able to score their plastic thing? I think some people made them, just kept them big. Oh, okay. So the way yeah, you, you don't have to do, that's not part of the, I just think it's more convenient. I am not able to cut through that plastic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see Yannette's looking really good. So yeah, you take the you take the paper. It usually doesn't look like very much, and then you stick it in the water. And this is where you can use your forceps um, and rinse it off, right? And what do you guys see? So mine says nano at Stanford. Oops. Can you see that? It's pretty. It's a bit faint, but it's actually going to get um, darker over time. And then what you'll do is I'll put it on a piece of um, uh, paper towel just to dry it off like this. Okay. So we've got our nano at Stanford here. Got to represent. And then actually over time, the blue will darken. But basically what's happening is that the light is being exposed, right? Um, exposing and oxidizing um, the thin layer of this uh, blue um, blue compound. It's an iron compound um, that I cannot remember right now, but um, I have it in the activity notes, but um, it's blue and it uh, gets oxidized and then um, gets washed away by the water, okay? Because it becomes water soluble. And so that gets removed and then you're left with your design, okay? And then um, what I like about it is that, yeah, over time, it'll be really, it'll get really dark. So you can even see it's sort of slowly getting darker as I'm talking. Okay. How long does it need to go in the water for? Just like, a, like just until you see the blue go away. It's just like okay. a dunk. It's just like a little dunk. Um, but so this is really to mimic, and um, Jenny, thank you for coming back. But uh, yeah, we're talking about models, right? So this is a really great way to model what an engineer would be doing inside of the clean room, okay? So um, I won't get into too much detail, but um, yeah, so that's it. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? 
Can I dry it in the sun afterwards? Or yeah, like yeah, yeah. It should be fine. Once it's exposed and cleared off, it should be okay. Okay. But if you leave it in the sun for like a whole day, it might get bleached out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Jenny, did you have anything to add on this particular activity at all? Are you good? Um, not at the moment. Okay. I have lots of things to add when I want to talk about stuff tomorrow or at the discussion at the end. Yes, ma'am. End of today. Okay. Let me see if I can squeeze in all these. Okay. So while we're finishing this, while you're wrapping this particular activity up um, and thinking it through, I want to go over um, some of the information that we had. I hope we have time, but if not, we can take a break at lunch and um, keep talking about it in the afternoon. Um, but what I wanted to go through was, oops, you know, again, nanoscience is this set of ideas that are based on an evidence on evidence. And again, Jenny made these slides. I love them. If you want to interrupt Jenny, please feel free. Um, but you know, this is, I loved her analogy. Actually, Jenny, do you want to present this slide? Cause I think you would do it better justice. Yeah, sure. Okay. So this idea of model building, when we talk about models in science, what we're actually referring to is not a physical representation, but we're actually referring to a conceptual understanding. So when we say model, we're talking about a set of ideas in our mind that explain phenomena or explain things in the world around us. And so in this particular slide, um, I created this because I was kind of showing Angela how I conceive of this, how it makes sense to me, this whole NGSS and talking about phenomena and model building and questions and things like that, is that I think about the student as being a car. And it could be any kind of car in terms of, you know, student equity and things like that. Not every kind of student has a fancy race car. Some of the cars don't run as well. Or, you know, you can think of different ways of thinking about the student. But we start off with a driving question. And this is part of NGSS way of speaking about instruction at this point is the driving question is literally what are we trying to figure out? And Angela is giving us this great question of, what is nanoscience? What is nanotechnology as our big driving question of what are we investigating? Well, as teachers, we have to plan a series of activities. And these activities fall into what Angela's already mentioned, a storyline. And a storyline just refers to the sequence. How are we going to sequence it or present it in such a way that students can follow these different activities and build on their ideas? And so we have this sequence of activities that is basically the road down which we're traveling with the students. Now along that road, uh, we have guardrails to keep them on the road to get to our final destination. And those guardrails are our essential questions and all the little questions we ask along the way. And Angela has been doing a great job actually modeling that process for us. We do something and then she asks us questions. What do you see? What do you think? And it's all those things that we ask students in the classroom as teachers while we're teaching different things. And sometimes if a student comes up with something, they ask us a question or they say something which seems to be a misconception, we can, we can kind of shoot back to them another question that kind of leads them to better understanding without actually just giving them the answer. And so all these questions form the guardrails along this road that keep the kids on the road traveling down this sequence that we've designed, which is our storyline. Now, each one of the activities we're presenting is a way for students to experience phenomena. In other words, investigating phenomena is how we learn about the world around us. And so the phenomena, for example, that we just did is how there could be a chemical reaction when exposed to sun to create an image on a certain type of photosensitive paper, or how dripping nail polish onto water creates a thin film that we can then lift up on a piece of paper. These are phenomena. And the beautiful thing about being part of an institute like this is Angela's exposing us to different ideas for activities to experience the phenomena that allow us to investigate the nanoscience concepts. Um, so it's an opportunity to observe, explore, and investigate those phenomena. Traveling down the road, eventually, the point is to get to a model. And again, model referring to a set of ideas or conceptual understanding of whatever the topic is that we're exploring. And so that's, that's basically, in a nutshell, a way of thinking about NGSS and using models 
to explore the world around us. Great, thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I think Jenny, I, I think Jenny did a great job presenting this slide, so. <laughs> okay, any questions on this? Any, any um, clarifications or anything? Lucia, it looks like, oh, okay. All right, so we're gonna keep going. I think we're almost to time, but um, so I think these were nice questions that Jenny um, had written up, you know, that are something that are these driving questions, right? Um, that you can sort of set up as a class, um, as a group or individually to sort of say, what is technology? What is nanoscience? How small? And these are questions, obviously, we are currently trying to answer. So it is a little bit of this, we're in kind of this chicken egg thing where we can't answer maybe all of these questions, but we can start to. Um, and throughout the next couple of days, again, you know, we're trying to to help you answer this and then, you know, eventually help your uh, students answer this as well. So really quickly before before we end for the day. So again, or if not the day, the lunch break. So again, this is a, some examples. Jenny already sort of went over it with the thin films and the self-assembly, thin films and the photolithography one that we just did. Um, but again, you know, one direct translation is the nanoscale. How are we figuring that out? Well, um, we're using that by, we're using an activity to explain that. Um, using the card sorting activity, or you know, how do we figure out self-assembly? And that is using um, all the different types of Legos and the foam and the magnets activities that we were working on yesterday. And then today is obviously how do people make nanomaterials? So so far we did a few examples with the, especially with the the um, sunprint thing, um, but we'll do some more later today. Um, and then eventually, you know, we're going to lead to this applied nanotechnology day or applied nanotechnology information. Okay, all right. So, um, and uh, Jenny, do you wanna discuss this one or do you have anything to add with the previous slide? Uh, sure, just briefly that again, conceptual models are a set of ideas. It's not something physical. It's the ideas we have in our mind. They can be represented mathematically, physically, or in some or so, sort of depiction like drawings or diagrams but that models themselves um, can be developed. In other words, if we're starting from scratch and we don't know anything about a topic, it's the development of those ideas in our mind and that set of understanding. But they can also be applied. Like once we have knowledge, how do we use that knowledge to make, create, or design something? They can be revised. Because when kids come into our classroom, they don't come into our classroom with uh, a blank mind. They have ideas in their mind already. And so going through these different processes, these instructional guidance that we give the kids, we allow them to revise and change their ideas, even throughout a, a single lesson. They may think something at the beginning, and then their idea changes even within a single class setting. And also models can be evaluated. We can look at models, which uh, a theory is a model. So when we talk about all the different theories, theory of evolution, uh, the theory of the, the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang theory, all of these things are models. They're sets of ideas that explain the world around us. Great, thank you. Okay, and then um, this is, so this is a great example of Jenny's uh, way of lesson planning. So I just wanna st stick this in as fast as we can, um, but um, this uh, model, or I guess lesson plan model. I guess it's a little bit of both almost. Well, it's just a way of conceptualizing the interaction that you have phenomena that we observe. And every day we're observing phenomena. I mean, the sun comes up and down. Um, how does rain fall from the sky? Um, how does light shine off of a water puddle that has a film of oil on it? Everything that we're observing in the world around us, these are all phenomena. Um, we can ask questions and our brains actually are naturally geared in this direction. If you talk to somebody who's three or four or five or six, why does that happen? When does it happen? What causes it to happen? I mean, you can get a million questions. So our brain is naturally seeking an understanding of the world around us. And students have questions. If we allow them to experience something that's engaging and interesting, they're going to have questions about that. And then of course, as we mess around with that phenomena, make observations, test it, manipulate it, then we start to develop a set of ideas to explain that phenomenon. And so this interaction is very iterative. 
and it can go in any direction. You can start with a model, you can start with questions, you can start with phenomena, and you're constantly moving between those different aspects of developing understanding of the world. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, and yeah, Jenny will talk a little bit and elaborate on this a little bit more tomorrow when she talks about um, the way she designed her, her nanoscience unit, I believe. Yeah, okay, great. Um, okay, we're not going to do this, but I think we can consider this sort of over lunch, right? Which is, you know, how can these activities from this morning or even the discussion this morning, how would that, um, the, even the NANU is, I would consider it as an activity. How would that kind of come into play in your own classroom? Um, and then sort of the takeaways from the discussion diamond. And just a reminder, you can finish your discussion diamond. I, post, I posted it in the Google Classroom. So um, whoever wants to share theirs, they can just, you know, drop the link of your discussion diamond, um, Google Doc or Google Drawing, I guess, into the, the assignment. That would be great. So we can take a look um, when we come back. Um, other than that, I believe it's lunchtime for, for some of us, for most of us. <laughs> okay, so then we'll come back um, in about an hour and a half, but I'll be online if you have any questions or want any, any um, just to chit chat or something like that, okay?